Good afternoon, everyone. It gives me great pleasure to welcome Professor Basim Shahada, who is an associate professor at the Computer Science Department at KAUST. Professor Basim is a founding faculty at KAUST, and his main research area is on the energy and resource allocation in wired and wireless communication. He has done a lot of work in cloud computing, fog computing, Internet of Things, and underwater networks. In today's lecture, he's going to be presenting us with his journey in underwater communication. This is something that he has been working on for at least four or five years right now. In 2017, Basim and his team successfully built a system which is capable of actually transmitting reliable live video underwater using different types of lasers, diodes, and considering different types of water conditions. They commonly refer to the system as Aquafy, and this is gonna be the basis for tomorrow's and today's internet applications underwater. Not only that, he's doing a lot of pioneering work in the area of 5G and 6G, and he's going to try to link both areas together in today's presentation. It's a very exciting talk. I will commonly refer to this as Skyping underwater. I don't know how people are going to be Skyping underwater. They have to use some special gear for communication since they cannot be speaking while they have their mouse piece. But uh, nevertheless, this is something exciting, and this is really some pioneering work. Today also, we're going to have Alison with us, who's a live artist from Sketch Effect. He's going to be joining us and live uh, sketching what is going to be uh, displayed uh, on the presentation, and he's going to be bringing to life this common experience in a visual and a memorable way. He's joining us from Atlanta, Georgia. So with that, I, I leave the floor to Basim in order to share with us his presentation and his exciting work. Thank you, Khaled, uh, very much. And uh, thanks for uh, inviting me for this uh, great event, for the organizers and for the techni technicals and everybody uh, who is involved. So uh, today, uh, I'm going to ask you for an extra task, Khaled, is just make sure that everybody here has a water safety certificate in handy, because uh, I'm going to ask you to, to go around and see uh, who, who doesn't have it. All right, so uh, we'll start with uh, a bit of a, an overview of what we do actually at the networking lab in KAUST. We are uh, primarily uh, interested in looking at uh, existing wireless systems and in particular, what are the systems that affect us uh, in our daily lives? For instance, uh, this example that in front of you shows you that uh, about 400 milliseconds of extra delay can cause Yahoo to uh, decrease the traffic of their customers by about 9%, and 9% translate to, uh, to actually a, a big money. So having this fact that is actually everybody can search and find it, we went to our labs and we start building uh, our own uh, wireless system that uh, somehow imitate what could be a delay cause. And we found that this is really a true, and uh, the delay can actually reach in wireless networks by about uh, one second, and I imagine that 400 millisecond to one second, that's, uh, that's quite a tremendous, uh, tremendous delay. So we look a little bit more microscopy, uh, microscopically into the problem, and we found that in today's systems that we are actually handed right now, we have the buffering layer is, is over, is over, is, is bloated layer. For instance, that the link capacity can be much lower than what uh, we can actually inject uh, in, into it. Therefore, we have optimized the amount of data that we can store in these buffers such that we can streamline what could be going out from the application all the way up into the wireless link. And in this case, we come up with multiple different technologies to enhance this delay and we were able to bring this delay down by 10x time. And as a result of this, our technology was also uh, uh, deployed in cows uh, solar panel area in the in the eastern side of the, of, of the campus. So this is the general theme of what we do. We look at the problem, we try to uh, look at the system how, and look deeply into what the system is actually happening. And then we extract the problem, enhance the problem and redeploy our enhanced system. All right, so uh, going uh, forward quickly into what you guys are here waiting for, we are, uh, why, why underwater, of course. Uh, we are living in uh, the planet. The planet is basically about two thirds of it or more than two thirds of it is, is water. 
uh, we are experiencing uh, a quite uh, a, a propagate a, a population growth and it's expected in 2050 that the population is going to be around the 2.7 billion people uh, we have uh, global warming but also the ocean itself contributes to around 95 percent of the generation of, uh, of, of oxygen we extract a lot of our uh, biotech uh, uh, solutions from, from the water. Uh, we need also to maintain this kind of environment uh, for, for the sustainable generations. Uh, and in fact, uh, our, uh, under our, our water planet, we, do, we did not even see more than 5% out of it. And the 95% the, the of it is, is, remains unseen. So all these things together makes, makes this kind of water uh, volume of, of, of the earth is of an interest to everybody, including uh, resources, explanation, uh, solutions, and, and many other things. And in fact, if you want to look at the water itself right now, it can be ranked at the seventh uh, global uh, economy body by itself if you wanted to, uh, to, uh, to, invest, to invest into this. We, when we wanted to approach the, the water or the underwater systems, we have some kind of constraints. These constraints comes from us as human beings not living in these environments, or these environments could be very harsh for us in terms of uh, water uh, temperature, currents, salinity, and obviously we don't breathe in the underwater. And some of these, uh, some of these things actually affects any kind of network that sits in the underwater in terms of the network design, communication links or transmit, transmission rates, uh, and also channel characterization. For, for the network design, in fact, if you look a little bit deeper on how do you want to design any kind of inter underwater network, we, we can't do fixed things because yeah, it's kind of difficult to put nodes in a fixed position because of the currents. Uh, well, even if you are able to do the, the, the fixing of the nodes, you may not actually be able to have a reliable communication, even if you are doing tethered or untethered kind of cabling, because this has an advantage and disadvantages. And I'm going to talk about that shortly. Channel characterization is also a problem, because if you want to look at the vertical, if you take a slice of the ocean or the sea, this slice is not homogeneous. It, it has different salinity levels. It has different temperature levels. It has different current levels. Some, some of them goes into this direction. Some of them goes into the other direction. And that affects highly any kind of underwater data transmission uh, things. But luckily, uh, the seawater has a very low absorption window for the laser operating at 400 and 550 uh, nanos, nanometers. And this actually key open, or this is, I would say, a door for us to explore uh, the wireless uh, connectivity in the underwater. I'm going to show you throughout the talk uh, shortly. All right, so what can you see today? Well, you can see many of uh, uh, re remote operating vehicles that can be working at the commercial level. For instance, they can go deep in the water up to like 300 meters. They can stay there for almost six months without maintenance, and they can transfer data to satellites, cables, and so on and so forth. And that's, that's something very commercial. But if you want something for fun, you can uh, look at this uh, so far tri Trident drones. Well, I like their expression on the website. They said they fly in underwater. This is uh, quite uh, interesting. But it can record high definition videos uh, up to about 100 meters, and it can operate for three hours. And if you want to go beyond three hours, if you wish, uh, there is an underwater stations where you can actually hook your drone into them and then you can charge your drones uh, using uh, induction or other, other facilities or other tools, okay? And these uh, underwater stations, basically, uh, they can generate up to around 50 kilowatt of energy that can be absorbed by currents and waves and other sources of, uh, of energy that they can take. It can be under the water. So it's like a clean, you charge your underwater drones with a clean, a clean energy, okay? All right, so what are the, basically the underwater communication techniques that we see so far? Of course, a tethered one, they are very well known. They, these are 
the cabling that laid down uh, in the oceans for thousands and thousands of kilometers, they can connect Asia with, the, uh, with, with North America, they can connect Europe with North America. And we have multiple hundreds, or maybe thousands of these cables lying down to, uh, to, to maintain the high demand of the internet between these continents. And the rate can be in megabit per second to terabit per second, depending on the number of fibers that they, they are there. And they can range up to thousands and thousands of kilometers. Of course, these more like a static type of operation because you lie down these, these cables and then you are expecting them to work for months or maybe years with very little maintenance. But of course you have to have repeaters because the signal can fade over the distance. Well, the advantages of these systems is basically they are high bandwidth and they are really simple. The second one, when you want to go uh, into, the, into the wireless domain, then the first thing that you would read about, which is the oldest technology so far, is the acoustic, the acoustic signals. Well, acoustic signal works, luckily, for a couple of uh, kilometers, uh, but their data rate is really uh, very low. So we are talking about kilobits per second. And this kind of rate, usually it is not sufficient for the high demand internet application that we see today. Again, acoustic networks, they are there. Many uh, users are using them for very specific and dedicated applications that, that they wanted to, uh, to obtain. Uh, more recently, we started to see optical uh, that can range from tens to hundreds of, uh, of meters. Uh, the challenges of that is basically the water uh, basically uh, turbidity uh, and the object that they can be uh, moving while uh, the, the sender and the receivers are being uh, communicating. And also uh, the particles, the micro particles that are existing in the water. And that's something we cannot actually avoid because the water is not something very clear as we can see it when, when you open your tap uh, at in the home. And uh, but but on the other hand, optical network can give you something close to uh, gigabit per second links if you are talking about clear water for short distances for uh, uh, applications, which is which is quite decent. Very recent uh, also technology that they can be used uh, is the radio frequency RF. Yes, yeah, radio radio frequency can actually operate in the underwater again, but in kilobits per second to megabit per second for very short ranges. And if you if you actually go deeper uh, into the ocean, you will find that the pressure and uh, the, the, the water uh, density and all that stuff forces you to be closer if you want to communicate uh, in, in, in hundreds to thousands of meters uh, below the water. But if you are communicating on the shadow or, or on the surface, you can be a little bit uh, more apart. And that's all about uh, because, because of the challenges of the, uh, of the water itself. OK. Now, uh, data center networks. Yes, don't be surprised. Microsoft and other uh, big data uh, organizers, they are now uh, running away from uh, placing their, uh, their, their data centers from uh, the land where they can pay taxes. They are responsible for pollution or other things. Pollution comes from generating uh, electricity through uh, fossil fuels and stuff like that to something that is much more clean and nice and more or less it's cost them much little money. For instance, in this uh, particular picture that you see in the front of you on your hand, right hand side, this is a Microsoft underwater data center that can actually operate reliably by extracting uh, the en energy from the water currents and they disseminate the heat naturally into the water. But don't worry, these uh, centers will not uh, contribute to the heating of the oceans or something like that because uh, they are considered extremely minor considered of what, uh, what you go deep uh, in thousands of meters below. The temperature can reach up to 800 uh, degrees uh, when there. Okay. Well, uh, also, this is uh, quite uh, also interesting. Don't, uh, if you try to retrieve one of your pictures and you find it, it's wet, so you would know where it was stored. Okay, so what has been done uh, recently in terms of our own lab, we really get interested into the underwater uh, research in a very early days, as the Professor Khaled Salama just mentioned. 
Uh, our very early days uh, of, uh, of interest into the underwater started when uh, British Petroleum uh, failed to close the well, the well uh, that, uh, that exploded in the Gulf of Mexico. That was around that time, 20, uh, 2010, actually. And one of their fundamental problems is that it was deep, it was hot, it was high pressure, cabling was hard, and uh, sending robots uh, into that area was very harsh. So we thought about, okay, well, uh, it's all about cabling, it's about monitoring, it's about sending things there. So why don't we start doing things wirelessly? So we initiated uh, our first step into this research by doing an optimal node placement for the underwater wireless sensor networks. And the result of this is that we found that we cannot actually operate into the optical domain in the, in the, in, in the ranges of thousands of, of meters. So we used a low frequency like 100 kilo, uh, kilohertz to uh, 40 kilohertz, very low frequencies. And we were able to operate these sensor modes uh, at, at, different, uh, at different rates. But again, it was in kilobits per second range, ranges. We uh, explored uh, this into, uh, into the Red Sea here in, the front, of, uh, in, in front of KAUST uh, by implementing the scheme uh, using TELUS, uh, TELUS B uh, uh, modes and in, implemented by uh, TinyOS uh, operating system. Then we shifted the gear really fast into uh, uh, another uh, interesting and important uh, uh, project that we have done by where to place uh, an, uh, a beacons, okay, we have sensors and we have a beacon and the sensors can report to a beacon and the beacon is extremely important to extract what could be the sensor information and the application for this application was the uh, water supply system and this, this project started with, uh, with, with collaboration with Texas and them in, 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 in Texas, United States. And our application was basically is that we wanted to launch uh, very tiny, like a dime size sensor that they can be chemical, uh, chemical detector sensors. And we want to launch them inside the water piping system uh, that, that goes into the houses. And, we, and once it detected any kind of chemical component into the water supply system, it can flag really quickly at the beacon and then we can shut down that, uh, that, uh, that pipe to prevent the, the, the contaminated paper water to go into the, home, into the homes. Until recently, with collaboration with the, with the photonics uh, lab and the communication uh, theory lab, we started in 2017 a point-to-point -point link of underwater real-time video streaming. And again, also we enhanced that into the bi-directional links. I'm gonna, not going to talk about it in details because I have the full slides on, on these uh, shortly. So our basic methodology is that we design a system. We take the system software and hardware. We demonstrate the data and we evaluate the results. Then we redo again to the design or we enhance the design and we re-evaluate the system and so on and so forth. This is going to be a cycle until we come up with an optimal, optimal uh, system performance that we can demonstrate. And, and, and the coming uh, three projects that I'm going to demonstrate follows the exact same, uh, same pattern of, of work. All right, my first part is going to be a point-to-point -point links for underwater real-time video streaming. And in this particular system, on your right-hand side, that's the hardware that we have used. On, the, your, on, on your left side is going to be the software components that we are using. And the picture in the middle was taken from uh, the Photonics Lab uh, implementation. So basically, the hardware component is we have used the USRP. These are very flexible devices. You can program them to operate in the way that you like. For instance, you have a USRP. You can put the binaries for a Wi-Fi. It becomes a Wi-Fi system. If you want to put the binaries for, uh, for a cellular system, you can put it for cognitive radio system. You can put the binaries, and then they can, they can operate in the way you wish. In this particular system, we have used them for operating as an interfaces for data modulation for the underwater environment. Uh, along with a MIMO data and synchronization cable with antennas and with an ethernet cable to extract the data. This is the ethernet cable. You connect them to these, uh, to these systems to extract the data. And also we have used uh, a, uh, a, a, like a webcam, a webcam that is connected to the system. On the, on, on the software requirement, we have a PC, which we basically was running Windows at that time. Uh, we have all the modulation libraries that we have implemented to do the underwater modulation systems. 
Again, we have the modulation for the antennas and the emulation software. We have used National Instruments Lab View uh, System. Uh, this is uh, in, in, in more details the, uh, the model of, the, of our system. Basically, on the transmitter side, we have a data generation, which is going to be the camera, the live camera, the 4K camera. We add some synchronous bits, uh, we wrap up the packets, and we do the modulation, and we put it on the transmission link to the, uh, to the laser, to the laser diodes. This laser diode goes into the underwater channel inside the tank, and this tank is actually five meter length. We ex extended that into 20 meter plus by doing mirrors and reflecting the light, the, the laser light inside, inside the, the water tank, all the way until it received the signal from the photo detector on the other side. And then we basically reversed what we have done uh, at the transmitter side by doing the re receiving side. We take the signal, we demodulate the signal, we, uh, we, we, we check that the signal is actually received correctly by doing the bit error rate calculation, and then we take the data out and view, uh, view, the, da view, view the image. This is a sample uh, visual results for clear water that operates or modulates on a four quam system. As you can see, for clear water, basically, the bit error rate was almost zero. So this is equivalent to transmitting your video or your images or anything over like a real cable without noticing that there would be any issues or any, or any problem. But once uh, the water uh, is not clear, like it's like, for instance, in this particular experiment, it becomes a harbor water. And, uh, and how do you simulate the harbor water? You can actually uh, make the water not clear by using different solutions that you can add in, into the water by making it uh, simulating like the harbor water. And as you can see in the front of you here, even with a quite uh, different modulation schemes, the receiving signal uh, on your right hand side is not as good as the sending signal for both different modulation system. And this is basically because you are getting almost uh, 9.9 .9 to the power of minus nine bit error rate, which is relatively small, but it still affects the quality uh, of the transmission media. So this is actually give you an indication that even with this small uh, bit error rate that, that actually uh, appears, this, the, the, the significant, it can significantly affect the output results uh, on, the others, on the other side. And of course, we cannot operate on the clear water all the time because the, 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 the planet is not uh, clear water. It's, all, it's, it's, uh, it's full of, uh, of more like a harbor water, as I just, I just mentioned. Okay, so uh, uh, basically uh, going out from uh, just a single link between the transmitter and the receiver, as you can see, if you, if you recall from that uh, slide, I just mentioned two slides ago, you have a laser diode that sends the data all the way to, uh, to the photodiodes. But what if we have a little bit more deeper understanding of the underwater channel? Why don't we just have a one directional uh, laser and followed by uh, another directional laser that goes onto, onto, onto the other way. And this is exactly what we have done. If you look at the figure here in the middle, you can see that we have uh, two type of channels. There is the green channel and there is uh, the, the, the blue channel. And, and the green and, and, and blue, these are different frequencies of the laser that we operate. And guess what? Well, I, I like what Galileo just said is that by just repeating the simple example that we have done there, it can reveal more data or more information that we can have. For instance, the experiment that I just showed you, uh, just sl one slide or two slides ago, it was using one single video download downlink channel. But adding this kind of uh, feedback uplink channel to understand what is going on into the water was basically bringing us into encoding or more data that can get, it's a feedback data that we give to the system and that let us to uh, encode much higher uh, bit rates and much higher quality of the video. And I can tell you that with this experiment, we were able to transmit a 4K video by doing this kind of bi-directional uh, system. And that was happened basically in 2018. So the same experiment I just showed you, but we have added this kind of blue uh, feedback uh, uplink channel. And this kind of blue feedback uplink channel was able to give us a precise measurement of what's going to be the possibility of the errors that happens in, 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 uh, in, in, the, in, the, 
uh, in the link. And that feed it up all the way to the sender and the receiver. In this case, we were able to do what is going to be the best modulation scheme and to, or to be able to get the 4K video that I just showed you. These are some of the visual results. As you can see, these are the two images uh, on the left and the right. You can barely see uh, a huge difference between both of them, but if you do uh, have uh, sharp eyes, I hope you all do. If you look at the hair of this girl, uh, it is not as precise or as sharp as compared to this one, but still it is within the range of the ultra uh, high definition video uh, that, that, that was actually uh, generated because of this feedback channel. Uh, here I'm gonna uh, run for you a demo of uh, by my former student, uh, uh, Abdullah Al Halati. He is right now uh, currently with, uh, with, with Saudi Aramco. So I'm gonna uh, shift into uh, his uh, his uh, his video. My name is Abdullah Al Halafi. I am a Kaos PhD student in the Networks Research Laboratory under the supervision of Professor Basim Shahada. In this project, we are uh, interested in the transmission of big data from oceans deep. Uh, more specifically, we are transmitting real-time video using underwater wireless optical communication networks. Uh, the video packets are transmitted in the underwater channel using green laser diode in this case. Uh, through the uh, channel to the optical photodiode receiver to be processed and displayed by the host PC. We have uh, prepared the system and we will now perform one of the measurements. We are going to transmit one of the videos now underwater. We show here the high quality and clarity of the video transmitted in the underwater channel. The video packets are generated, encoded, modulated, and transmitted through the USRP units at this side, uh, through the optical laser devices to the underwater tank that simulates different ocean water turbidity, salinity, and uh, varying temperature levels at the sea bottom to uh, the optical uh, photo uh, diode receiver. Uh, this technology is enabling the oil and gas offshore operations to inspect, monitor, and repair their subsea pipelines and structures, and uh, foreseen to reduce the operational costs associated with uh, offshore vessels accompanying a tethered ROV. Uh, this also shows a video uh, for my professor Basim Shahada uh, when transmitted in the underwater channel. Our uh, networking lab at KAUST, we are generally interested in two uh, main uh, uh, fundamental challenges in networking. Okay. We'll thank uh, uh, Abdullah for this uh, demo and we'll resume. As you can see, this can actually work in, uh, in basically static videos if you want to stream the video lively or even unlively in both, in both ways. Of course, this work, because it was unique uh, in, in, in 2017, 2018, it has attracted the worldwide media with the support of our communication uh, advertisement team in Kaos. They have done a really an amazing job in advertising this in, in Kaos uh, Discovery. And I encourage everyone to keep track on these, uh, on these kind of events. Now, this brings me to, uh, uh, to, the, to what everybody is actually really waiting for is uh, Aquafy uh, system that we have also developed uh, quite recently, actually 2019 to 2020. All right, in uh, Aquafy system, well, one day uh, I had the chance to chat with uh, Professor Slim in my office and then he was thinking about getting uh, the devices in the underwater, all that stuff. And then he was thinking uh, about adding a cable that is connected to the USB or uh, whatever the hardware of, of, of the phone and then connected it uh, into the like a hub in the middle or something like that. 
And then I told him, Slim, why do you want to do that? There's no need to for cabling or doing anything of that sort. If you want to have an internet underwater, try to facilitate or try to utilize uh, the built-in component of the system. You have a Wi-Fi signal, you have a Wi-Fi system, you can have a Wi-Fi receiver, and within one to three meters range, you can just use uh, simply the the, the Wi-Fi uh, the Wi-Fi uh, uh, communication part, and then from the other part, you can just use lasers or use LEDs or use uh, everything. And that actually meeting in, in my room, I still remember it, it, it was the first step for creating the Aquafy uh, concept in details. And then we sit down again a few times and we said, okay, let's do it. So uh, this, this, uh, this QR code that links you to the, to the, to the Aquafy paper for those who wanted to know the technic technicalities of this system. So the entire idea was basic, basically as follows. You have a diver that sits in a uh, certain, uh, certain depth. Uh, uh, could be snorkeling or diving or whatever. His system or his handheld device can be connected wirelessly into uh, a device that can be placed on the cylinders that, uh, that, that actually the diver is carrying. And what, well, what I was actually trying to, to, to say there is that I don't want uh, something that is highly sophisticated or a system that needs a lot of energy or something of that sort. I said, okay, I wanted this kind of module that sits in the middle, something they can, it, can, it can basically operate on five volts, very uh, straightforward, easy to program, and it can, it can provide for me, uh, I would say like an underwater wireless router if you want to, to, to make it in that concept. So that brings me into uh, the using of, uh, of uh, Raspberry Pis. For those who doesn't know Raspberry Pis, it's like a, just a mini PC. A mini PC operates, you can operate any kind of Linux operating system on it, or if you want to run Windows, if you want to run any kind of software on, on, on that hardware, it's like a mini PC. This mini PC uh, can work on five volt, like you can really run the entire system on a power bank that you can carry with you for four hours, if you wish. It has a decent CPU processing capabilities. It has a decent RAM built in, of course, and it has a Wi-Fi module. It has a Bluetooth module. It has a graphical units. If you want to have the graphical units, of course, in our case, we don't have. So the first phase of implementing Aquafy uh, we said that, okay, our ultimate goal, of course, is to come to a megabit to gigabit per second uh, of throughput, but we said, okay, let's do it step by step. Let's try, first of all, to integrate the, uh, the connectivity between the Wi-Fi network with the optical by using the LEDs, the light emitting diodes. And why LEDs? Because you can actually run and operate these LEDs from the Raspberry Pi unit itself, okay? So what we have done is that we set up uh, an access point that's straightforward by just running one command. And we let our wireless uh, devices like our uh, smartphones to connect to that access point over uh, the Raspberry Pi. And from the Raspberry Pi, we use the UART, the UART connectivity transmitter and the receiver when you can see the bin number eight and the bin number 10 in the figure here. Uh, to, to, to modulate or to take the data out uh, in, in an on and off keying scheme to uh, the, uh, the LED diode itself, okay, by, by boosting the diode. And, and we were able to, in fact, obtain up to about 600 kilobit per second experiment. And this experiment we demonstrated uh, in late 2018, uh, uh, 2019, we demonstrated uh, the live Skype uh, video uh, calls between two ends using uh, Raspberry Pi uh, interface. And also we have used point-to-point -point protocol for uh, taking the Wi-Fi packets or the wireless packets and uh, frame them into the optical packets and we do the reverse when they receive at the receiver. Okay, so uh, uh, we were not happy about 600 kilobit per second and we said that that's not what our ultimate goal is, 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 is it should be. We said, okay, uh, let's replace the, uh, the LEDs with lasers. And here comes uh, quite a bit of challenges because the lasers needs different power, it needs uh, different uh, characteristics and requirements. 
including alignments, of course. So uh, with, uh, with, with these things in mind, we were able to, uh, in fact, increase the modulation of the UART link to about 100 megabit per second for an on-off keying transmission. And we were able to use the laser diodes uh, in the system uh, and transmit uh, live stream uh, files over uh, Wi-Fi and the lasers. And the figures that you can see here below is basically can give you what could be the varying lengths uh, of, of, the, of the links that we were obtained by using the laser systems. And the one here on your right hand side shows you that more or less the round trip time in terms of the delay is reliable. That actually gives you an indication about the system of being reliable. Well, the transition between phase one of Aquafy using LED to the phase two of Aquafy that using laser wasn't actually easy. So you have to do a lot of <laughs> experimentation. You could end up burning some of these USRP, the, sorry, you, uh, these, uh, these uh, Raspberry Pis. And this is exactly what we have done because of playing with the currents at different, at different uh, values. But at the end of the day, you were able to bring it all the way to the pool of cows and you can experiment and you can uh, generate the data. And that's actually gets uh, the, the, the beauty of the success of deploying the system. All right, I'm gonna stay here a little bit of time to give you uh, the chance to uh, maybe uh, read uh, or maybe point your phones to any of the online resources that, uh, that talks about Aquafy. Of course, you can just read, uh, you can type it on the internet, you will find the tons of resources. But what I like you in particular to focus on is basically look at the, uh, the, the development uh, uh, code that we have on GitHub uh, uh, site. And also, if you wish to see the Aquafy uh, LED demo that has happened in the networking lab, you can, uh, you can take the QR code and uh, it is already available in Google, uh, in Google uh, uh, Drive. Okay, uh, what's going to be next? Uh, well, it's going to be Aquafy++. Okay, people start with the programming with C and now they come up with C++. We, quite, we start with Aquafy and then we grow to Aquafy++. Well, uh, Aquafy++, uh, what we are aiming at is basically we wanted to have a throughput boost. We don't want basically to live with uh, 600 kilobit per second or 2.1 megabit per second. And the bottleneck of the system at that time was the, the, the usage of the, of, the, uh, of the Raspberry Pis. Well, the Raspberry Pi, it is, it is a PC at the end of the day. So we, we, we make it to work as an underwater gateway or underwater router, but it's still, there is a lot of resources that are wasted in the Raspberry Pi for doing other things, okay? So ideally, if you want to do a throughput boost, you need to have like a, a real a homogeneous modem that has the Wi-Fi component integrated with the optical component seamlessly. So it takes the Wi-Fi packets, just wrap it up and put it onto the uh, optical channel for the longer distance transmission. That's going to be ideally. So we are now investigating the circuitly uh, requirements for doing this kind of straightforward uh, modem that can take the Wi-Fi all the way to the optical and that hopefully will get us into the gigabit per second throughput. Another, another thing that we need to pay attention more into the, which is called the automatic alignment and all, all the alignment. Of course, divers are actually mobile. It would be easy for them to get their hands and photo something or take a live video and uh, send the packets using an RF. RF does not matter much if you are moving your hand to the left or to the right with a with, with 45 even degree angle or 30 degree angle. That's not gonna be a big deal for a Wi-Fi. But the problem is that uh, for the laser component, the laser component, the alignment is very important. And with this kind of nanometer uh, scale of laser, the, the alignment was also considered in the underwater, that's actually making it more challenging. That's going to be a, really a, a big problem for, uh, for, for the applicability of Aquafy. However, there are many uh, promising solutions that we can adapt. For instance, like have a MIMO, uh, photodiode system. So the laser can shoot into like an, uh, receivers of uh, multiple centimeters to even meters if you want. And that's gonna give them more chance to, 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 to work in the underwater. 
we could have arrays, we could have feedback systems, we can have a lot of things that can actually uh, give the chance for uh, the alignment to, to, to happen. And also we wanted to have, uh, to increase the range. Uh, so far lasers, uh, well, they work, of course, in the underwater. This has been proven up to 20 meters. Well, at 20 meters for divers, that's probably, I'm not a diver myself, but I'm hoping that this is enough for the divers uh, people, but uh, for any other industrial or commercial uh, business or application, 20 meters may not be sufficient. So we need to increase the range by doing uh, repeaters or by doing other technologies like adaptive detection arrays or something of that sort. Okay. And of course, uh, I'm gonna end here with, uh, with thanks to the, everybody who get engaged into this, uh, into this project over the years, starting from the members of my own team, members of Professor Boone's uh, Photonics Lab team, uh, members of the Professor Slim's uh, Communication Lab teams, and also the funding that we have observed, obtained from the Ritz Research Center by Professor Michael Berman. And this uh, gentleman here, uh, Mohanad Hamedi, I'm gonna thank him also uh, myself because he was the one who gave me the insight of how to present the work in a non-technical, I would say attractive way, because he, he, he worked out with me on the design of these slides. Thank you for everyone. Thank you so much, Basim, for this exciting, uh, truly interdisciplinary talk. I mean, like this is the type of work that combines expertise from different fields and you really need to work together in order to achieve a product, semi-product at the end. So this is like something that's not theoretical. It's actually to be able to deploy it in the real environment. We got lots of questions, but before we start our questions, I'd like to invite Alison to share with us his views and his life sketching of what we have heard so far. This is just a teaser to what's to come later when at the end he's gonna be sharing with us a much more detailed version of this uh, sketch. So this sketch tells you the story of this lecture in a nutshell. So we'll, we'll give us more, 15 more minutes and we'll get more details. So going back to Basim, and thank you, Alison. The first question that uh, people are asking, how is the system of optical communication in underwater different from uh, air communication and line of sight communication? And what are the challenges that you feel that could be more problematic for underwater versus uh, free space? OK. Uh, well, this is, uh, of course, an interesting and important question. Free space optics was studied before even underwater. Sometimes they overlap over the researchers together. Free space optics, of course, they are, uh, they are uh, suffering from, uh, from the same attenuations uh, that happens in the underwater, but uh, the causes is different. For example, in free space optics, you could have dusts, you could have fogs, you could have other, uh, other atmospheric issues. And in fact, in free space optics, if you wanna look deeper into the design of these systems, even the very small shaky that happens uh, because of the winds, if you wanna place these kind of sender and receiver at the top of the buildings, can make the laser alignment uh, problematic for, for, many, for, for many cases. In the underwater, we, we also have the same thing where laser is physics. We cannot play with the physics. Physics is physics at the end of the day. In the underwater, we have water turbidity issues. We have objects. We have uh, microorganisms or, 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 or micro micro system micro. Uh, uh, I would say like uh, particles. Fish. Yeah. You have fish. Uh, the fish is the worst, actually, <laughs> especially if they are lazy fish that they can just sit there for a couple of minutes. <laughs> they can block your connection. So well, they are. They, they both have attenuation, they both, both have absorption, they all both have scattering, but the causes of these, uh, of, of, the, of, of, of scattering and attenuation and absorption differs from the free space optics of the underwater. Okay, so that leads me to a second question about water turbidity. So yes. is there a solutions to deal with water turbidity? Uh, in, because this is like, seems to be a big problem, of course, beside the alignment problem. This is, this is true and this is the fact. Again, we are dealing with, uh, well, 
water turbidity is itself is, 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 is a science by itself because the water turbidity can differ from a portion to a portion. Like you don't look at the ocean as one single homogeneous thing. Actually, the ocean has layers and layers of different uh, salinity, temperature, turbidity, and all that stuff. And every layer has its own animals, uh, living, or, or, or living systems and stuff like that. So it, it, it is really something very complex, especially for those who wanted to do a vertical research. Uh, I, that reminds me of a work that I, that, I, that I started doing about a year ago. What if you actually doing a laser that goes from outside into the water, like from the surface into the water, not everything is underwater, like part of it is into the, in, in the surface and part of it is in the underwater, what's going to happen? In fact, reflection of the laser at the surface is itself is a, is, is a big problem. And that matters if you are shifting the laser from this centimeter or meter to this meter, because the water is not homogeneous at this, at this kind of level. So how to solve this issue? I think the only issue in my opinion is by doing, an, by pushing extra power into the laser so they can, they can have more energetic beams that they go into the water, but actually that might cause some kind of health issues for the underwater environment. That's not my, my area of research. I don't know about it. But in what I learned from wireless system, the more power that you put into the sender, the better signal you, will, you are going to penetrate and, and, and so on. So in your Hopefully. talk, you touched upon the combination of Wi-Fi or wireless uh, uh, RF uh, signal and uh, optical underwater. So you have your device, it communicates with a gadget that the diver would be carrying. Uh, did you think also about combining this with acoustics? So you would have okay. like a system that has hybrid, it has acoustics, it has Wi-Fi, uh, RF, and it has uh, optical as well. And which, yes. which one would be used for which application? Yes, uh, the only problem with the acoustic is that our handheld devices that we have right now is not operated with this kind of hardware and it's quite bulky. The, the acoustic signal requires bulky systems. What my, our aim is that I wanted to have a technology that they can be handy for the people. So I don't want them to buy an extra gear. I don't want them to have a different technology. I want something off the shelf. Uh, they can use their own phones. They can preserve their own videos that they can take in the underwater and so on. Uh, but while transmitting them lively. So that, that actually fundamentally my, my, my main uh, goal. Having acoustic, yes, it is possible to have an acoustic, but then again, we go back to the bottleneck of kilobit per second. What sort of application that they can, be, they can work in tens of kilobit per second? Even running a Skype video call is going to be very problematic in this kind of case. So that's why I think the acoustic phase is more or less still remains for some deep commercial work, but not for public that we are uh, that we that we want or not as suitable for the internet as we as we see today with with what people are actually trying to uh, to uh, to achieve these days. So talking about skyping underwater, if I'm a diver, do I have to start learning sign language because I wouldn't no, be able no. to? No, 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 no. It will be very easy, uh, uh, Khaled. Uh, well. Uh, you know, there is a kind of a case that you can put on top of your head, right? Okay. Yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to give you the whole thing as a, in, in, in a wireless way. You use a, a, a wireless headphone using Bluetooth to your phone, and you send your voice through that, okay? The phone is going to translate this into the Skype call. That's something that you don't need to touch because we do that in, in any way. So that's the first wireless channel between your uh, wireless headphone, which is as battery equipped in your head anyways, under the, under the helmet. And that connected to the, to the system. From the system goes Wi-Fi into the, into the back gadget that you just explained, which I call it like underwater wireless gateway. And that underwater wireless gateway will take the wireless Wi-Fi packet, translate them into the optical, and the optical will take it all the way to the surface. And that's three hub wireless system using three different technologies. Now, one problem that I could envision regarding the system is that divers are not static. So divers no. keep swimming and thus your laser is gonna be moving all the time. And that requires that the receiver has to be moving all the time and synchronized in its movement. Otherwise, I mean, the, we are not talking about millimeters or centimeter changes. The diver is actually in a in few minutes is going to be like one meter apart. So, I mean, things are going to be moving rapidly. Yes. How are you yes. going to deal with something like this with lasers? 
Okay, I, I'll, 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 give you, I'll give you an example. Have you, have you uh, seen this kind of recent uh, Japanese technology where you point your, uh, your, uh, your okay, where, where there are flies inside your room and you want to kill that fly? What do you do? You point something into the fly and while the fly is actually moving, try to trace it and it gets beam it with a laser so it can kill that thing. So this is going to be more like a, a, a diver generated tracking, not, not a system generated, not the system will track the diver. The diver will be tracking the, to transmit. In this case, we, we need to have a kind of an automatic alignment system that can keep focusing on where our destination is. So that's something similar, I, I would say, okay, uh, if, if you look at the DJI uh, company, the DJI company came up with something very interesting. Regardless of the mobility of the drone, your camera is always static, if you look at it, right? And that's actually one of the biggest innovations that they have come up with. It's windy, it's not windy, you move forward, you move backward, the, 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 the camera lens itself is always static. That's something that we need to work on. So you have this kind of transmitter and the receiver that is somehow uh, focusing while the body is moving. That's, that's something where, where we want. Of course, it's challenging, but uh, I think we, we, see, we, see, we do see technologies that are coming out that we can benefit, that we can benefit from uh, uh, very soon. We have one question regarding the wavelength. I mean, what type of wavelengths that you would be uh, going for if you want to have a transmission that's very long distance? Like, and what is the longest distance you could envision that this system could operate at? Okay. Both at the horizontal level and at the vertical level. Okay, well, uh, we have not done the vertical level. We don't know. Uh, we have done the horizontal level. Uh, the wavelength that we are talking about here is the green and the blue. Uh, these are the wavelengths that we use from, from, uh, from the lasers. And for how long uh, this, has been, this experiment has been done by Professor Boone's team, and I think he has achieved about 20 meters. And uh, the problem is that we cannot go really for kilometers if people are thinking about it, because again, there is enough scattering, there's a huge scattering that comes under the water, and the channel can fade a lot. So if you want to do that, we have to, to have repeaters. We have to have like uh, something that can take the signal and generate it again uh, with an extra power. And in fact, this is not uh, something very uh, strange for the scientist because if you are applying like fiber cable, like a regular fiber cable and the water, this cannot run for thousands of kilometers. After certain distances, you do also have a repeaters to, to, to put this to, to, to forward or to, to boost the signal for the next uh, 100 meters or so. And that's, that's the tradition for these kind of long distances. Anyways, even if you want to do it, even not underwater, if you want to do it even above the water or uh, anywhere else in the world, you need repeaters. Okay. Now, uh, if I'm a student, I'm interested in this project. I mean, what type of background should I be uh, having? I mean, do I need to be a computer science student, electrical and computer engineering student, optical uh, background? marine life background, what type of experience do I need and, and how can I go around building that experience? Okay, it all depends on what is your point of interest in the system. This is a huge system. As you can see, there are many labs that work on this. If you are interested into in boosting, for instance, the throughput, then you have to go lower into the, into the optical channel, optical channel characteristics, and uh, how do you want to model it? How do you want to enhance it? And, how do you, and that actually requires a lot of background in physics and mathematics. And that's typically, well, I don't believe there's a student good for that and students, for, students are good for everything. But in general, you need to strengthen your, your background into the mathematics and, or, and physics part. If you want to do the system integration where you want to play with the Raspberry Pis, you want to, 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 to build the point-to-point -point protocol, you want it to, uh, to integrate all these components together. That's mainly software to hardware components, electrical and computer engineering uh, type of students or computer science students. And if you wanted to see the effect of these uh, systems on the underwater marine life, then of course that has to be a marine, uh, marine, uh, marine life student uh, with, 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 with a background expertise. Okay, uh, one last question regarding lasers. I mean, uh, are we worried about uh, marine life exposed to these lasers? I mean, like we are, we keep polluting our environment with noise and marine life has been, I mean, noise-free 
they have faced a lot of chemical pollution. People are dumping lots of sewage in the water, their plastic in the water. And now we are doing, we're starting to include the electronic pollution that we are facing above the ground with RF okay. signals and Wi-Fi and communication. How do you okay. feel about that? Well, uh, to answer your question or the student question, or the, the, the one who asked this question, let me go back into the history to the very first time where people laid down the underwater cables or the underwater optical lines. What was the reaction of the environment? Do you know what? These lines were not very well sealed and it attracted the sharks. And it happens to be the sharks are very, uh, in fact, uh, sensitive to the electromagnetic fields in general. So with this kind of uh, shark attacks, they started to find that the sharks start to bite these things. They, they think that this is, uh, there is food inside or something like that. So they start to attack these kind of cables. Until the moment we learned what the shark is actually interested at, we started doing doubling the layers and, and doubling and, and so on and so forth until we have something very sealed where the electromagnetic uh, waves does not propagate through that cable. We are in the same situation right now. We are now exploring these kind of technologies in the underwater system. We are going to see a reaction to these kind of lines. But hopefully that they stay away from it so we can operate and they can be safe. <laughs> At least this is something visual for them, for, for the fish and for the other things. They, they could be scared from it. But of course, until something happened, we will not be able to know until this thing happened and we learn out of it. So I, I really have no answer to this question. So uh, I'd like to uh, invite Alison to come back again and share with us if he had some other improvement to this uh, sketch which we're also going to be sharing uh, online using the Twitter feed for Web 2021. So here are the most uh, interesting questions that came out through this uh, conversation, the answers, the challenges, the system components, all of these are going to be uh, further clarified and demonstrated in this uh, sketch that we're going to be sharing with you afterwards. Thank you so much, Alison. And with that, I'd like to thank uh, Professor Basim Shahada for uh, his interesting talk. It's a very entertaining, it's a truly an interdisciplinary uh, problem, interdisciplinary solution, interdisciplinary team. I mean, it had to come all together at the right time. And that's why you get to work on something that is high profile, that gets um, uh, viral online. I mean, I remember the day that I woke up in the morning and I started seeing my Twitter feed and social media. I mean, going on crazy about Aquafy and I called Basim that day and telling him what's going on. What did you guys do? Because I was scared. There must be something drastic that's happened that actually caused this fury of uh, tweets. Again, thank you so much, Basim, for amazing talk. Thank you, Khaled. Thank you very much for everybody and for the organizers and everybody here. Thank you. And much. thank you. And please uh, come visit us, uh, attend our talks, and disconnect from your daily life and connect with us in Web 2021. Thank you.